if you see a blind or vision impaired person at a bus stop or on the bus or whatever, or at a crossing or just generally, you know, there's lots of more street furniture than there, there was previously, like pre-COVID. So we're having to navigate a lot more street furniture. So if you see somebody with a vision impairment, just walk over and say, hi, is there anything I can help you with? We don't bite. <laughs> well, <laughs> the dog definitely doesn't bite, I might. <laughs> It's just ask, just ask is the biggest piece of advice I would give any sighted person. And don't be offended if we say, no, I'm fine, thanks very much. Like, it's perfectly okay for us not to need help as well. Um, but don't, don't grab somebody because I have actually been walking down the street and um, people have, they have genuinely th thinking they're being helpful, have grabbed my arm to help me across the street and I, like not saying anything just grabbed me and I honestly thought I was being mugged so funnily enough I didn't react very well <laughs> and then they got highly offended because they were just trying to help and you know um, so yeah the first thing you do is you speak and you ask if the person needs help. I'm Roisin Dermody I'm a disability rights advocate and um, I'm also a guide dog owner so if I need to take a taxi, um, I have to plan in advance. So um, I need to give myself enough time for the, like whatever the, the, the appointment that I'm trying to get to, I need to give myself twice the amount of time that it would take to get me there in a taxi be, to make sure that I actually get a taxi to get me there. Because if a taxi shows up and refuses the dog, then I need to order another taxi. So that always has to be kind of part of my, my planning. So um, I tend not to take taxis, except in, in circumstances like, say for example, if I'm going to the airport and it's just the easiest way of getting to the airport rather than having to take three buses or whatever. Um, or like if I'm going somewhere that I don't know, um, so I don't actually know my way to the particular building uh, or you know, I need the taxi driver to help me like locate the door or something like that. Um, because I don't always have a sighted person to, you know, do the route with me in advance of going to a new place. Uh, it, it happens quite regularly. I mean, I've had two, I had two taxi, taxi incidents on Sunday this week, just gone. Um, both were at a taxi rank. The first driver just drove off and uh, the second driver, um, they were, they didn't refuse to take her, but they insisted that we sit in the back of the car um, because of COVID. Now, Clifford's not trained to sit in the back of the car and nor is there enough space in the back of the car uh, for Clifford to sit on the floor because like guide dogs are not allowed on the seats. So they're trained to sit in the footwell in, you know, in the front passenger seat. And I sit like on the seat and she's obviously in the footwell with me. Um, there just isn't that space in the back of a car to do that. If a, um, a taxi refuses a guide dog and the complaint is uh, successful, then the driver gets a 40 euro fine, which um, quite frankly isn't enough of a deterrent. Like um, on Sunday, for example, like I was at a taxi rank and the taxi just drove away. Um, and I have no way of making a complaint about that taxi refusing because I didn't have the contact details or I, I have no way of identifying the driver or the taxi they were driving. Um, so I think maybe if the, I don't think the penalties are severe enough. I don't have any identifying information about either the drivers or the taxis they were driving. So I have absolutely no recourse because I can't see who they are or like I can't see their, their, their um, licenses or anything like that. The biggest problem I find with Dublin bus would be that not all the drivers uh, stop. Like they don't, okay, so blind people wait at the bus stops and we don't see the buses coming. So we're not actually supposed to put our hands out or we're not expected to put our hands out. The driver's expected to see the guide dog or the white cane and stop for us and tell us what number the bus is and I know over, like during COVID 
um, maybe due to like, you know, there being 25% capacity or 50% capacity, or now I think we're up to 75% capacity, you know, maybe there isn't availability on the buses, but buses tend to fly past a lot more these days than they would have done previously. But then again, previously I would have been traveling during, um, during rush hour. So loads of people were trying to cram onto the buses at the same time. So there was plenty of people at the stops, you know, to, to flag down the buses anyway. Um, I think the biggest issue that I would have would be with say if three buses come together and um, I can't, I, I, hear, I hear the first bus, but I don't necessarily realize that the second and the third bus have pulled in behind because I can only hear the engine of the first bus. Um, so I don't know, and like I mightn't be looking for the, you know, the first bus, but I might be looking for the second or the third one, but they've pulled out and gone before I even realize they're there. So then I have to wait for the next one and it's, you know what I mean? It, it things like that. So um, it's very handy, like say if you're uh, traveling at rush hour and you get to know the people who are traveling at the same time as you from the same bus stops. So, you know, people will be very, very good and kind of say, oh, I'm getting, you know, say the 39A, you know, I, I, I normally see you on my bus and um, that's, that's the second or third bus that's going to pull in here. So, you know, come with me and, you know, we'll get on together. Things like that, like it's, it just makes my day so much simpler. If a, if a guide dog is in, our, in harness, they're working regardless of what you see them doing. They're not just working when they're walking. If she is in a meeting with me, and I need her to be quiet at a meeting or an interview or, you know, in this particular situation, she's in harness, even though we're sitting in a park. Um, and I know she would love to be rolling around on the grass, but I need her to be quiet and well behaved while we're talking. So I leave her harness on and she knows that she's in work mode. And so she'll behave like she's in work mode. If I take her harness off, she's just a regular dog. Um, so if you see a guide dog in harness, um, then just you can't approach them without the permission of the owner. And the owner might not always be in a position to give permission. They don't have to give permission. Um, like if, for example, if I'm like running late for work, I'm certainly not going to stop just because you think my guide dog's cute. <laughs> Um, I have somewhere to get to. Um, but if I have time, um, I might stop and, you know, let you say hello. But not all dogs, like I can, I can do that with Clifford because she's not easily distracted. She can like switch straight back into work mode as long as, you know, when, when we've said hello and we need to get back to work, she can switch back into work mode. Not all dogs can do that. So not all guide dog owners are in a position to allow you to pet their dogs so don't again don't get offended if one guide dog owner will allow you to say hello to their dog and another guide dog owner won't um, because they know their dog and they know how their dog will respond to the distraction of somebody wanting to say hello to them